Good morning to our viewers here in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us today. The massive pipeline that is supposed to carry natural gas from Russia to Germany under the Baltic Sea has been in the news on and off over the past few years. The controversial project, known as Nord Stream 2, is more than 90% complete. Work on the last 100 or so miles has been at a standstill for seven months because of the threat of U.S. sanctions. The pipeline, which is being built by a company that is majority owned by the Russian gas company Gazprom, has led to fears in Washington that Russia's dominance of energy supplies to Europe could translate into political leverage for Moscow. The Trump administration is concerned that Nord Stream 2 will give Moscow economic and political leverage over Europe and will ultimately undermine Europe's energy security. Such worries are not new. Natural gas from the Soviet Union and after its demise Russia has been crucial to powering the European economy for decades. However, transatlantic differences over Nord Stream 2 seem to be coming to a head and they are stoking tensions between Washington and Berlin. In mid-July, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced revised guidelines regarding sanctions on energy pipeline projects, including Nord Stream 2. And late last week, three Republican senators, Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, and Ron Johnson, sent a message, uh, sent a letter to the managers of the Fairhafen Zasnitz on the Baltic Sea, threatening, quote, crushing legal and economic sanctions, end quote, if they continue to support the project. Visiting Russia this week, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said yesterday that it was his country's sovereign right to decide on its energy sources and that no state has the right to dictate the energy policy to the EU. Joining me today to talk about the transatlantic debate over Nord Stream 2 are former U.S. Ambassador to Poland Daniel Fried, who is the Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and Dr. Kirsten Westphal, Head of Geopolitics of Energy Transformation at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin, also known as the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Dan and Kasten, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to join. Good afternoon from Berlin. And good morning from Washington. Glad to be here. So before we hone in on the current tensions and their implications, let's talk about why this project is so controversial. The Trump administration is hardly alone in opposing Germany's pipeline deal with Russia. Ambassador Fried, in the past, you have argued that the completion of Nord Stream 2 is not in the US or the European national security interest. Why is that? For many years, really since the Clinton administration, the United States has supported multiple energy sources for Europe so that no one country, not Russia, not the United States, nobody has a monopoly, a near monopoly, or the ability to exert leverage. The problem is that Nord, the problem with Nord Stream 1 and 2 is that it increases Russia's potential leverage over Europe. And this is how. Nord Stream 2, like Nord Stream 1, allows gas to be shipped directly from Russia to Germany. That means that Russia could, in theory, cut off gas to central in the pipelines that run from Russia through Central Europe, squeezing the Central Europeans, the Poles, others, without endangering its energy and commercial relations with Germany. That is a form of leverage. Now, the German argument has sometimes gone, well, the Russians never mix energy and politics. But in fact, we know that they do. They have, in fact, used energy cutoffs as a form of pressure against Ukraine. They've done it. So that's the problem with Nord Stream 2 it tends to increase Russian energy leverage. Now, it isn't just the Americans who have a problem with Nord Stream. It's also a lot of Europeans in the European Parliament, European Union governments, and let's be honest, a lot of people in Germany. Um, I've never liked Nord Stream, not since Gerhard Schroeder concluded the deal. Um, 
when he was chancellor and then immediately took a place on the board of the supervisory company overseeing Nord Stream. Hey, ethics like that, he could join the Trump administration. Um, but it's a strategic problem. That said, the Trump administration has been so aggressive with Germany generally on a host of issues and on Nord Stream 2 in particular, that it has made discussion of this issue difficult. If you're going to try, if the US is going to try to convince the Germans to take a different approach, it helps not to be screaming at them, throwing rocks at them, and insulting them every chance we get on issues large and small. But there is, despite the fact that the Trump administration says so, there's still a legitimate security issue with Nord Stream 2. There's a way around it, but I'll get into that later. So obviously you're, you're helping set the table here and there are a number of issues that we'll, we'll pick up on, but I guess one issue that I'd like to push you on just a little bit is, do you look at Nord Stream 2 as more of an economic issue or a geopolitical issue? Well, the German argument is it's just business. Now, come on, seriously? Um, Germans, you know, the German foreign policy establishment is far from done. These are very smart people. They know perfectly well the potential political and security risks. There may be a way to deal with this other than sanctioning German companies. And, you know, I think the letter of the three senators was mm, ill-advised and the threat possibly not actionable. That doesn't help. That's a different issue. The alternative, there may be ways to deal with the potential problem of Nord Stream 2 in ways that don't involve sanctions. But that's, that's a separate discussion. I can get into that if you want later. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Westphal, um, Ambassador Fried has put a, a lot on the table for you to, to respond to. Um, you've spent much of your career focused on the energy sector and energy policy in, in Europe. And as Ambassador Fried outlined, even within Germany, there's not one single view on Nord Stream. Um, but I guess I'd like to start by getting a sense from you about why Germany is so focused on the construction of Nord Stream 2. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, Germany is now focused on, on the construction and having this construction going on because, well, it has been part of the long-term conduct with the project. But I think in, indeed, it, it, as it has been said, it's, it's, to me, it's not a black and white manner to be, sh to be sure with Nord Stream 2. Um, but it's it, and also not an issue of opponents and supporters, um, and it's a tragedy that we've dealt with the project in that manner, um, describing it in, in black and white as, as the world is grey, I would say. But um, it, in, indeed, I mean, Germany has reacted very much by spelling out that the project is commercially, um, given the fact that at the beginning it was driven by Gazprom and five uh, companies, two German companies, but three other European companies. And I, th I think it was very clear at the beginning that the German government bought into the assessment of the companies involved, A, that Germany, well, that, that Germany would need more gas imports, given the fact that own gas reserves are depleting. And I think we're seeing that right now with, with Gröningen even faster than we expected with the, the earthquakes. And then also, of course, because of the nuclear phase out, so now of the coal phase out, it, it was very clear that there is a backup needed. And this is also, as it's often said, it was a bet of the companies that, that Germany and the EU would not be fast enough with their climate policies going ahead. So this is kind of why I would say there is a strong economic um, backing of the assessment of the companies. And, and again, in that respect, it, it's driven by companies because it was as such inaugurated. And then there is the, the broader economic view that um, 
contrary to other European member states, Germany still has a large industrial consumption of natural gas. So just simply look at BASF, which basically has the amount of gas consumed as, as Denmark, for example. So there is a strong need in the German industry. And there was this issue of competitiveness looming in Germany in the whole discussions also with an eye to U.S. shale revolution. So I remember when the U.S. shale revolution started, we had a lot of talks on, on European-German competitiveness. And what came out also very clearly um, in the last, yeah, I would say, months, actually, is that also for end consumers, gas prices are important. So this is kind of where I would say the, the, I would pack the economic arguments. And then, of course, you have this very German approach, I would say, um, as, as, as falling back on the legal status quo and the regulatory status quo. And this kind of a, a statement that was leaked by Sigmar Gabriel, you remember the visit in, in Moscow, where he was saying um, that this, this, this project will be dealt inside Germany and its German law. And this was basically, um, I would argue, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding was, and this was backed also by several or by two legal assessments in the EU, that, that, that the legal situation in 2015 was exactly the way. But, but of course, um, I share the view, and this is why I'm talking about the world is gray. You have, it's not just an economic project. It has larger political dimensions. And I think the political costs of the project have long been overlooked by Germany. Germany has been very blindsided on that, or not Germany, but the German government. And, and there you can really see the split also inside um, the German political elite. So the cleavages don't run between party lines, but really across, um, let's say, political circles. So you had a strong concerns being raised by the foreign and security policy elite, but a clear voice by well, energy and economic um, analysts. And why I'm saying um, there was a kind of blindsided um, German political assessment. And I think um, this boils down to maybe three misreadings. And the first, I think, was what I described, this fallback position to an economic and legal position, so to compartmentalize Nord Stream 2, to, to, to pack it in a very narrow context and to do, deal with that in, in this manner. And this can only be understood by the, the, the approach of Germany vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis, um, Ukraine in, in this, I would say, a dual strategy of containment and cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Russia that started in 2015. Because in Germany, there was a strong belief that it would create a lot of um, credibility if Germany is instrumental to keep EU sanctions alive vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but at the same time then have this kind of small economic cooperation, narrow economic cooperation, send signals to Moscow that um, um, Germany still wants to cooperate on limited issues, to also have a channel of influence. I think this has always been overlooked from abroad, that this was also seen as a leverage in Germany vis-a-vis um, -vis Moscow. And plus also there was already in 2015 it, an understanding that the, Ger the German slash EU Russian energy relationship had deteriorated. So we had a number of issues already looming. Um, linked to the third energy market package. So that was the dish to somehow limit them or avoid further deterioration, which would spill over into other policy fields. So I think this was kind of a misperception. Um, and the other one was very obviously also starting in 2015 that the, um, the dynamics behind the energy union that was created in the EU so what we've seen was a kind of, how, how should I phrase it, a different time framing. So Germany was looking to the status quo of the legal and regulatory framework, while EU, Brussels, as described in member states, were moving into another direction to create, pull more um, 
competences in Brussels and also the more political authority vis-a-vis -vis of Russia in, in Brussels. And, and, and I think the US opposition to the project was somewhere far out there. And as Ambassador Daniel Fried described, it was seen as well under the lens of this is something we've seen in the past. This is something we've seen in the 80s already with, with now the, the Ukrainian pipeline that is now the, the holy grail, so to say. So but I would finalize by saying, oh, finished, it, it's so complex because the contextualization is so different. So every observer puts this project into a, a different context. It could be just like an onion that you you peel, and and every layer is bringing you um, and views, um, and this makes it so difficult to find a common language to exchange. Um, plus, I would also say what would has been observable and is really a challenge to Germany and the EU is that we've seen a, a real disconnect between market realities in the past years and political rhetorics and political realities. Because despite of all rhetorics in Brussels, we've seen record volumes of, out, of Russian gas being imported into, into Europe. Um, so this is, this is kind of, of really a, a paradox here. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, let me maybe push you on that just, just a little bit and, and just try to sort of focus the question, building on what, what Daniel Fried was saying a little bit earlier. From your perspective, does the pipeline undermine Europe's and specifically Germany's energy independence? Well, thank, thanks for that. No, I, I will respond in a black and white manner. <laughs> no. Uh, in, in a narrow point of view, um, looking really to energy security, no, it does not. Um, it, um, and I wouldn't talk about energy independence or something because when Germany is a net importer, the EU is a net importer with, with large shares. So it, it, this, is, this is a US discourse. Um, with self-sufficiency is nothing. So in, in any case, Germany will always have to face a, a large dependency. And then it's about really choices, flexibility, options, and diversifications. And this is something where one could really argue that in narrow, don't get me wrong, I, I, I really, again, the world is great, but in narrow energy market terms, to me, um, the project adds to a certain extent to flexibility um, and liquidity of the market. Of course, we have the danger, and this is my, my final phrase on that, and also linking to Ambassador Fried's point. Of course, there is a danger of market dominance. Yeah. Um, but this is something not to deal with sanctions, but it's something about antitrust policies, um, competition policies. And here I would argue, and, and I think the EU has proved that, that we have very, very good regulatory tools. We have cut into the rents of Gazprom. Gazprom has been pushed to obey to the rules. So this, this is also something where I would somehow uh, question this view that, um, that the, the pipeline itself is a threat to, to Eastern Europe, because at least in Germany, there was the view that Germany, a gas coming directly into Germany would give Germany more power, would um, also pull responsibility in Germany to, to deal with the market power of gas, gas problem. And Germany is the big market and the kind of hub also physical and virtual trading hub inside Europe, saw itself in, in really the position to, to face Russian gas power. And of course, Russia has used this power. I'm not questioning that, and we could go into that. So we've started to get a couple of questions from viewers that I'd like to, to fold in before we get into the, the current um, sanction uh, threat. Um, because it has more to do with, with just the pipeline itself and, and policy on the pipeline. One of the questions is, does it make a difference that Europe has LNG import port capacity that is comparable to the same volume as, as Nord Stream 2, and that the pipelines have been upgraded to allow reverse flow from west to east? Or are those factors less relevant than they were at first? Dan, you're nodding your head. Why don't, why don't you tackle that first? 
Do you remember I said earlier that there were ways other than sanctions to mitigate the potential risks of Nord Stream 2? And the question hits on some of those. Europe's energy independence and energy security is in far better shape vis-a-vis -vis potential Russian pressure than it was 15 years ago. That's because of LNG capacity, both in the abstract, but also LNG import infrastructure in Europe, in Poland, in the Baltic states, um, and because of a network of secondary pipelines that allow gas in Germany to go to flow east through Central Europe to Ukraine. 15 years ago, Ukraine got almost all of its imported gas directly from Russia. Now it gets that imported gas, even if it's Russian gas, through Germany, through Central Europe. So the, the Russian ability to cut Ukraine off has dropped considerably. The Russians can cut off gas flows through Ukraine, even though they've made an agreement to continue those flows. But a, a cutoff of transit fees is not nearly as dangerous as a cutoff of gas altogether. So I consider the multiplication of secondary pipelines from Germany to Central Europe and the development of LNG capacity to be a strong step forward. And Polish energy policy, by the way, takes account of this. They have, the Poles complain about Nord Stream 2, but they're not sitting on their hands. They have been pushing exactly the sort of infrastructure, and it makes sense. The Three Seas Initiative, which was a, a Polish-Croatian um, uh, and Romanian initiative from the beginning, um, has as one of its pillars the, the continued development of energy infrastructure with the objective of undercutting potential Russian energy leverage. So there's been a lot of progress. Another area of additional progress is something um, Dr. Westphal mentioned, which is the EU third energy package, which helps demonopolize gas import pipelines. Um, the Germans are wrong when they said that this is a purely national issue. It's rather ironic. You know, the Germans are saying, are ignoring the fact that this is also an EU issue. And the EU has made progress in um, forcing demonopolization of gas, um, gas imports. All of these things, if taken together and multiplied, that is LNG, LNG capa infrastructure capacity, secondary pipelines, and implementation of the third energy package moves Europe in the right direction. I don't like Nord Stream 2, okay? Never have, never will. But it, whether or not it is completed, there are policy options other than sanctions to help solve the problem that we've been talking about. I think it drives the Poles and the Baltics crazy when the Germans lecture them about this, about Nord Stream 2 being only a commercial deal. Like, easy for you to say. You know, they're sitting far more vulnerable. Um, the Germans have the ability to support LNG, to be stronger in support of of rigorous application of the third energy package to support secondary pipelines, to support the Three Seas Initiative in ways that can help bring people together other than um, simply fighting about, uh, about sanctions options. So there is a way forward. Um, maybe it's my American naivete that I'm looking for a positive sum solution. And as I said, I'm not going to shed any tears if the sanctions kill Nord Stream 2. I just think that the sanctions are costly and they might not work. And always in policy making, you better have your plan B in mind. And plan B, which is learning to live with Nord Stream 2, but, but dialing back its potential bad, bad effects, um, is available if we go for it. Anyway, the question, um, you know, I wanted to sort of foot stomp the question because the person who asked the question is right. And this is where we can all get our um, policies aligned. Thank you. And Kirsten, since, particularly since we're talking about, about LNG, I wanted to fold in another question from a viewer, which is, 
how does LNG, whether from Russia or from the United States for that matter, align with the energy transition, the Energiewende, and carbon reduction targets in, in Germany? Um, yeah, this is also part of especially the German discussion right now around um, financing infrastructure for be it LNG or be it pipeline gas. So this is the other corner where you, you, you hear concerns and, and, and opposition voiced against Nord Stream 2, but also LNG. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a large debate in Germany um, around um, whether we, about whether gas is really a transition fuel and to what extent and how long we will need this bridge fuel. Um, but I can al also only full stop the question. I think this has been the, the big success story in Europe since 2009. Reverse flows, um, interconnections, LNG facilities. So there has been a lot. And, and I don't get me wrong, I didn't want to say that it's just an issue of national sovereignty in Germany, a national issue. But there has always been the emphasis also in Germany saying, look, we are interlinked, we have strong connections. And you can see this via the hubs and price convergence so that, that we basically are well linked to LNG ports in, in Belgium, France and so, so on. So um, it's, it's also a Northwestern European gas market argument. So you've, you've both touched on sanctions and, and Daniel Fried, you've, you've touched on it a little bit more than, than Kirsten has. Um, I, I would like to get into that, particularly since um, you, know, you, Dan, have, have said um, that although you don't think that Nord Stream 2 is in our best interest, um, sanctions are just not the appropriate means to deal with the risks of Nord Stream and that there are other options and you've touched on some of those already. Um, but I'd also like to hear you talk a little bit about some of the unintended consequences um, of those sanctions and how they could be they could be harmful. Um, perhaps as a way of teeing up comments from both of you, earlier today, Bundestag member Norbert Röttgen was interviewed on television, and he has not been in favor of Nord Stream two. Uh, and points out that one can definitely criticize Germany for taking the action of construction of Nord Stream 2. Um, but he said that sanctions um, against an ally is an unfriendly and, and not an acceptable way to go. And I, I think I'd, I'd like to hear both of you sort of respond to um, the whole idea about sanctions um, and, and what some of the alternatives might be. So, Dan Fried, why don't, why don't you go first? Okay, full disclosure. During the Obama administration, I was the, the chief negotiator with the Europeans and others in the G7 about the sanctions on Russia after their invasion of Ukraine. And I worked closely with the German government, and that was a good process. You know, we, we did a lot of handshake deals on how we would move and Everybody respected those deals. So I'm not against the use of sanctions. I am wary of sanctions use against allies. You know, Rutgen's a very smart man and he's got a point. What are the political costs if we're going after German targets? The problem isn't Germany. Look, I don't like the Nord Stream 2. I think it was the wrong decision. But we have, a, we have a Putin problem. We don't have a German problem. We have a problem with Putin's aggression and a, I th a German policy that I think it was a mistake. But those aren't the same thing. And we need to be clear that not to forget where the problem's coming from. My view is that set, we should prepare what I call contingency sanctions against Russian targets, contingent upon what? Well, should the Russians violate the gas transit agreement with Ukraine and cut off Ukraine from gas or cut off any EU member state from gas for no good reason? In other words, if the Russians act as they have and use gas as a weapon, then we ought to introduce sanctions but sanctions against Russian targets. 
And I know what our energy sanctions are like. There is headroom. We could escalate. Um, and I, this is what I would, if, if I were in the administration, <laughs> a different one than, than the current, um, this is what I would be talking to the Germans and the Poles about. Now, the Poles are always going to hate Nord Stream 2. I get that. But their chief energy security person, Piotr Naimsky, is a very smart man. You know, he, no fool, he gets this. Um, I would be talking with the Germans, the Poles, the Balts, and others about what we could do in the event that the, that the Russians escalate. The trouble with the current discussion of sanctions is that we're doubling down, putting pressure on Germany. Look, I'm old enough to remember what happened when Reagan um, started threatening Germany over the gas pipeline with the Soviet Union back in the 80s. Okay, two word answer, we lost and we gave that up. Okay, like we may win this time, but it may be costly. Mm -hmm. The polls are right about Nord Stream 2. I just think there's a better way to go than fighting with the Germans on this one. Again, it drives me crazy when the Germans say, this is just a commercial deal, or there's no political threat, or the Russians never do this, or the problem solved. Come on. There is still potential Russian energy leverage against the Baltic states and against Central Europe. The interconnections, the LNG facilities don't fill the gap. The numbers aren't there, but they could be there. They could be there. Um, if, you know, the, the joke would be on Putin if the Nord Stream 2 debate generated a strong US-EU energy policy that took what's in play, pushed it forward, embraced the three C's initiative, and ended up undercutting the original Kremlin rationale for Nord Stream 2. Everybody wins, except, of course, Putin. But that's, that's not my problem. I'm looking for a way forward, and I believe there is one. Again, I'll always hate Nord Stream 2, but it doesn't matter. There is still a, po a, a set of policy um, policies that could solve this. And by the way, I don't need the, um, the, the cynical talking point that this is a ju just about U.S. energy exports. In security terms, the, the, the LNG to Europe can come from U.S. or non-U.S. sources. From a strategic point of view, it doesn't matter that much because that LNG is going to go someplace. You know, I, I don't need warm, I don't need warmed over cynicism. Um, we need to take this, we need to take energy security seriously. And Kirsten, um, to, to what degree um, is there a differentiated response to this uh, threat of, of sanctions? And, and specifically, um, I'd be curious to know if the, the letter co-signed by Ted Cruz and others came as a surprise uh, to people in, in Germany. I think Ambassador Fried has already highlighted a, a very important point. We, we have had always clear opponents in Germany to the pipeline, but they are now really also complaining about the, 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 uh, the overuse or this, this harsh sanctions, the brutality and the rigidity of really a crushing or, or a threatening of crushing down sanctions to, to well, a, a, a local port facility. And, and in that respect, I think, yes, the, the, the letter came as, it was a certain surprise. I mean, we've seen other letters um, earlier uh, in winter, but, but this is a very special one, tackling really infrastructure and, and, and a port. Um, uh, so I, I think there is a new quality here. And um, I would say the reaction in Germany is really quite um, streamlined and, and shell-shocked. I think that there, there is really a shock about this um, sheer exercise of, of power and let's say economic force. So par excellence, do we see an example here of um, weaponizing interdependence really clearly? Um, 
And I, I think it, it, it is now tri trickling down um, an understanding that um, these sanctions is, 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 is part of somehow substituting foreign policy. It's, it's, it's like using and working on, on a, a toolbox. And, and we're not only talking about this move right now, but it's really we are seeing a list of sanctions. And Ambassador Fried has alluded to that. Where do we come from? We come from the 2015, 2015 sanctions, which were, were um, um, negotiated between allies. But then you had 2017 with, um, you know, Cat the Ketza Act, where there was the point on interference. Um, now um, you have, what I'm trying to say is it, it is less and less clear what is the contextualization of the sanctions and what are the motivations behind. So you get a whole load of its interference into elections. Um, it's, it's fighting corruption. It's on European and protecting European energy security. It's around transatlantic uh, energy security. It's transatlantic security. So it's, it's again a very huge contextualization. And then also the motivations I, I see are no longer clear. Is it really countering Russia and the Russian threat? And again, don't get me wrong, I really think we are facing a threat and it's, it's also a hybrid one, but then I wouldn't talk about Nord Stream 2 that much. Then I really worry around, you know, electricity, I worry around um, the whole issue of um, electric lines, digitalization, which is, is much uh, providing much bigger inroads. So I think then we should talk about this. But then on the other hand, there is a clear understanding that this is a bipartisan consensus still in, 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 in US. There is, of course, the reading that um, it's also about backing US shale industry. Once again, in Germany, we're coming from this debate of, of competitiveness and the big price gap that we've seen in the past because of the shale um, revolution. And, and this is, of course, uh, it, then the whole background comes in with the pressure on Germany because of um, the um, economic, the trade surplus that Germany is having. And then the big contextualization and issue linkage done with, with the spending on NATO. So, so this is, it, it's less and less clear what is really the end. It's clear that it's an end game. And, and I think in Germany, there was long been the issue that it may be a sandbox game, but it's a sports match. But now there is really the understanding of a fierce end game, as Ambassador Fried said. And, and this is kind of causing, I would say, the shell shock. Um, and, and if I may, I would also add uh, two other thoughts, uh, which, which maybe make it more clear in, in, in detail why it's so difficult to understand and grasp the, the cost and, and, and benefit analysis done by the US. Because what we're seeing now with the recent moves is that Ketza is used and, and, and the, um, the guidance on Ketza is changed, if I'm not mistaken. But there you have the safeguards under termination and sunset that you have to unbundle the pipeline project, that you have to maintain a transit due to Ukraine. And, and this has been done basically. There, there, we have achieved in Europe the new gas directive, which shall um, unbundle, well, shall apply the third energy market package to the pipeline. We have achieved the transit agreement around um, Ukraine and probably not in the volumes as as dreamed in 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 in, in Kiev, but this is very difficult under existing market circumstances, and also in compliance with EU uh, market. Um, regulation. And we're seeing this with COVID-19 now, how difficult it is to go beyond the market and, and really um, turn down or, or write down a political agreement. So this is kind of a paradox that is seen. And then also the issue, and I think Ambassador Fried alluded to that, this, this argument of feed the beast is kind of where we really see um, that the US is losing credibility and there is no longer a sense of appropriateness 
of the measures because the US itself imports 6% or at least imported 6% of its oil imports from Russia, basically the same amount as from Saudi Arabia. And so you could argue that the whole pressure of the US administration of Trump with its tweets on OPEC plus has done much more on, on feeding the beast um, than, than any gas um, selling could do. So we've received, I mean, you've both talked about this uh, and sort of the economic dimension um, of all of this, but we've received an, a number of, of questions, um, both via email and on the chat function, that really sort of try to look at the economic issue. Um, and in part, one of the tenors that I'm reading as I, I look at these messages is at the core is that the United States wants to sell its own fracking gas to Europe. Uh, and Dan Fried, you touched on this, that, that there are markets uh, for that elsewhere, not just the European market. Uh, but a number of people who are writing in seem, seem concerned that this is really, from a US perspective, looking at where can we unload our, our gas. Um, but from a German perspective too, there's an interesting question. Um, why has the German government decided to take the talking points from Nord Stream 2 companies rather than conduct a true independent analysis um, that would enable us all to understand the nature of the, the project. Um, and I guess I'd be interested in, in hearing from both of you what your thoughts are um, on this economic dimension, but also on um, why the, the chancellor largely looks at this purely as an economic issue and, and not in a broader context. Well, Chancellor Merkel is a wise person. I think whatever the complication, the political complications that led her to support the Nord Stream 2 gas deal, um, you know, she is, she is, <coughs> no, we're stuck with it. Um, and I'm in most things a fan of Chancellor Merkel with respect to the notion that this is just a U.S. marketing ploy, um, I said before, but I'll, I'll re-emphasize, that's a silly argument. Of course the U.S. is interested in exports, but from a security point of view, it doesn't matter. Um, LNG from non-Russian sources is going to be of equal value in addressing the security problem that we've been talking about, or the potential security problem we've been talking about. And besides, as, L as the LNG market around the world develops, it's not going to matter. You know, it's not a pipeline where U.S. gas has to go to only one place. The world gas market is going to become, how shall I say, more liquid as gas becomes more and more traded in an LNG rather than gaseous form. So you don't need pipelines. So this is, you know, it strikes me as a very 1970s neo-Marxist argument and it's 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 boring to me what i'm more concerned about and i think one of the questions may may have touched upon this and i'm asking this question archly is trump risking relations with germany because he's that concerned about energy security or is he rather picking energy security to advance his chief purpose which is to fight with merkel I mean, Dr. West Westphal raised this point, and I think she's right. What is the United States after? We claim that we're supposed supporting European energy security, but Trump seems to hate the EU. Um, Trump says he wants to push back against Nord Stream 2, but he seems to have never a bad word to say about Vladimir Putin. Um, he seems ambivalent in his support for Ukraine. So if, and I think Dr. Westphal has done a good job unpacking this, if there is a need for the Americans to make their case about Nord Stream 2 in ways that the Germans can hear or are willing to listen to, we, the Trump administration has gone about it in a, mm, an odd manner. For God's sakes, in diplomacy, you're supposed to be building alliances 
to achieve the result you want, not deliberately picking a fight, unless, you, unless your objective is to pick a fight. And that's what I fear. Um, it is a mess, but it is a mess that can be fixed. If you pull out the emotion, we're in much better shape. We, Europe, Germany, Poland, Central Europe, Ukraine, US, we're all in better energy safe shape in the gas sector than we were a dozen years ago. This is a good thing. It, we have something to work with. You have, I've made, yeah. you know, I, I, I still think like a diplomat where the job is to try to come up with solutions, not simply put a stink bomb, stink bomb on the table and walk away. And I, I guess as we transition to, to Kirsten, one of our viewers has asked um, how much of all of this has to do with Trump's angry obsession with Germany, which you've just been, been talking about. But from a German side, um, how much of this has to do with an intense dislike of Trump um, and sort of a, a blindness to everything else that's going on because of the dislike of the, the Trump administration? Oh, a number of points that I would like to touch on. Let, let me start with the question you posed to me, Steve, on, on the nature of the project back again. Now, I think, as I said, to me, it has always been more a fallback position, an easy fallback position for the German government saying that we stick that to this commercial point and to the existing regulatory and legal framework. But under the assumption that everybody in, in, in the EU would see that Germany has this containment strategy, keeping a consensus in the EU on the sanctions. And this has really been driven by Merkel. So this was seen as, as, as this duality of, of the strategy and then cooperation with Russia, because at the end of the day, Russia is there to stay on the continent and there to stay as an energy supplier. So I think this is, this is maybe a very quick answer to that. So it's, it's not that easy. And the talking points where there have been numerous studies launched by, by many coming either from the economic climate angle. Um, so I, I, my point is there are also studies out there that back the economic argument. There are other studies out there saying we don't need a Nord Stream 2. And I agree to that if we really had implemented our climate policies in, 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 the, in the target scenario. Um, the next point um, on US LNG, from the point of view on EU energy security, I think Ambassador Daniel Fried is right. It, it doesn't matter where the LNG comes from. And we've seen that um, the, the winter of 2019, 2000, yeah, of 2019 basically, where we saw seen more um, LNG from Russia coming in than from the US. But this is how markets work. And, and this is the, the big surplus, um, or the big plus, sorry, the big plus of LNG, which has done a lot on bringing gas prices down. So we profited already from the US shale revolution. But I think I'm, I, I, I question, I, I think from a new US point of view, of course, um, economic considerations and political considerations coincide because if I, I limit Russian um, um, ways of delivering gas to, to, to Europe and if I limit and there again we're not just talking about Nord Stream 2 we are talking about a broad range of sanctions if I limit Russian ability and this is what part of the sanctions tackle of producing oil and gas, then of course I enlarge a market share in the future for US LNG. And I think actually that the pressure is getting bigger with the COVID-19 consequences on US shale industries and other industries. So there will be a much more fierce competition on, on um, shrinking um, demand. Um, so um, I, I think this, the, 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 I have a, a, um, a limited well, this would be my remarks on, on the US motivation on that side. The other question was that you said, what, um, what is the US? Oh, I can't read my own writing. I'm sorry. There was the question on it concerning um, angry obsession. 
right. um, that, with that Germany. Much, yeah. So, and so, um, so yes. how an much, intense how much, dislike. Yes, the, the intense dislike in Germany of the Trump administration um, and, and whether that has blinded people to looking at this whole issue um, a little bit differently. And I think it's important in that context to, to remind everybody that this is um, perhaps being um, sort of reaching ahead, if you will, um, currently under the Trump administration, but the, the opposition to Nord Stream 2 has been a bipartisan issue in the United States. It is an issue, um, as Ambassador Freed mentioned, that started um, well before Trump uh, entered into office where there was opposition uh, to Nord Stream. So it's, it's not completely fair to say it's purely a Trump um, problem or a Trump issue, um, but it is one that is being polarized um, at the moment even more, uh, given the other tensions uh, and atmospheric disturbances between Washington and Berlin. Exactly. I, I mean, I don't, I, I say, yes, there is a dislike, but I think the dislike has um, a reason. And I, I would really relate this much more to this shock um, inside Germany of the, the conduct of international relations, the, the undermining of multilateralism, cooperation, multilateral agreements, standards, norms. And I think this, it, it, for me, it's too easy to boil this down to the person of Trump. It's, it's really um, the whole, it, it, and, 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 and just imagine Ger Germany by nature, but also the EU by it, its very nature is a multilateral animal, really, and, and, which, which needs um, a, an international law-based, rules-based um, international order. So this, the order long backed by the West. And I think that the, the big shock is, is not the dislike of the person of Trump, but really this, this shock of no longer backing the international order um, jointly established by the West. And I, th I think, and this is my point on, on sanctions very much, it, it is also the, 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 the trickling down the view that what sanctions really do to energy markets, gas markets, oil markets, so increasing the politicization of, of energy markets. What we're really seeing is that we, the, the, it's an, an enlarging the gray zone for European companies. And again, it's, it's by the economic regulation in Europe, it's, it's the companies that are the major tools. And they see their room of maneuver limited. And who steps into the vacuum? And you can see that really it's, it's Chinese companies, it's, it's state companies from Saudi Arabia, it's state companies from the Gulf. And this in the future is, is something that, that is really boring me a lot. As we think about worries, um, obviously this current situation is, is um, adding fuel to the fire um, of tension between the US and, and Europe. But yesterday when we hosted a, a conversation with Congressman Rob Bishop, he also said it has the potential to create fractures in relations within Europe and particularly with Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, both of you have a lot of experience working with Poland um, and you've touched on Poland a little bit in this conversation already today. Um, you've touched on Ukraine, but I, I guess as I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not um, the debate over Nord Stream 2 could really um, have a negative impact on relations within Europe? Um, it could and it is. The Poles and less vocally the Baltic states believe that Germany does not take their security concerns into account. And they're particularly frustrated when Germany tells them to, Germany especially tells Poland that it needs to respect EU norms. And then Germany says that Nord Stream 2 is a purely national project. That just drives them crazy. And it's a completely unnecessary fight. The Trump administration has continued a lot of Obama's policies in a constructive way in this. And by that, I include the stationing of NATO and, and 
US and European forces in the Baltic states and Poland. This started under Obama. Trump has continued it. This is a good thing. And by the way, Germany has the lead in the NATO battal combat battalion in Lithuania. So, you know, it's not as if Germany's not there or shying away. They're there. And, you know, Germany in Lithuania with the blessing of Poland is a big deal. Let's not forget. This is a good thing. So there's a positive side. But the negative side is that parts of the Trump administration, um, some of the ideological parts, seem to look at Central Europe as a wedge to weaken the EU as a whole, which is a terrible, terrible thing. Dr. Westphal mentioned this earlier, and, and as she was speaking, I was agreeing. A lot of the difficulty we have, we Americans have talking with the Germans sensibly about Nord Stream 2 has to do with the fact that we seem to be trashing our own principal creations after 1945, which is a multilateral rules-based system that favors democracy. That's a huge achievement. Now, I, the fact that the United States under Trump seems to be dismissive of that is just shocking. I don't blame the Germans for being shocked. I'm shocked. It's appalling. And I think Americans and Germans and others need as an intellectual exercise to think about the possibility of Biden winning the next presidential election and what we do. Biden has called for strengthening the rules-based system. Kamala Harris, his pick for vice president, said that the multilateral rules-based system is one of the great achievements of American foreign policy. Fabulous, great place to start. If that happens, then we're gonna have to be prepared to address some of the divisive issues in a constructive way. What does that look like for Nord Stream 2? I, you know, it can't be um, Germany surrendering or the Americans surrendering. There's gotta be something for all the stakeholders, the Germans, the Americans, the EU, the Poles, the Balts, the Ukrainians. Um, we need to start thinking about that. Another point I wanna go back to is the German policy balance between, uh, as Dr. Westphal put it, containment and cooperation with Russia. Mm -hmm. Look, any sensible Russia policy will have elements of pushback against Russian aggression and the search for mm, stabilizing the relationship and cooperation where possible. So I agree with that, but it's not our fault. We are not the guilty party here. You know, the Russians invaded Georgia, they invaded Ukraine, they've tried to hack the German Bundestag for which the German, the German government has sought EU sanctions. They're the aggressor. We should deal with Russia as it is. It's a problem. I don't think Russia can, will always be a problem and I'm perfectly happy to consider a better relationship with a better Russia. But for now, we shouldn't tie ourselves in knots thinking of ways we can make Putin feel better about us. Um, you know, he needs, he needs to think um, we can hear you, so shush. Um, babysitting, COVID times, babysitting my granddaughter. So we need to start thinking about, we need to put this in the context of a Russia policy, which is transatlantic, sustainable, but not one based on a, a misplaced sense of Western guilt. No, it's not our fault. Um, it's Putin's fault. He's messed this up. And, you know, Germany's done its best. Obama did his best with the reset. Um, it's up for the, it's up for, to the Russians to start getting serious if they want a, a more stable relationship uh, with the world. But that's a different issue. Look forward to having that. Thank you, Dan Fried. Um, we're slowly running out of time, but but Kirsten Westphal, I want to give you a chance to to make um, some some closing comments as well. Um, if you'd like to touch on on Poland and Ukraine, you're welcome to do that. But if you'd also like to just sort of 
tell us how you think things will play out. Um, that's, that's an option as well. This has been a wonderful statement by Ambassador Fried, and I'm, 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 I'm happy to just join in. Um, I think, yeah, it's true what, what Nord Stream 2 has done. It has already uh, created fractions, of course, inside EU. It has also exposed energy use energy policy dilemmas. So the unclear um, understanding of market versus state-driven policy-based um, actions also, the question of the EU Commission as a political actor is, is very unclear. So there we see a dilemma. What it has also done already is actually limiting Berlin's room of maneuver. We've seen a cut into Berlin's authority with the new EU gas regulation. And I think this is also something to, to be seen in Washington. What the sanctions now do is also undermining EU regulation and, and bringing in that into absurdity. So if you really impose sanctions, then all the moves by the EU no, no longer play a, a role. And I think the EU is dealing with the issue. And I was kind of desperate to see um, Berlin being reluctant in the past to just shift this issue of Nord Stream 2 to Brussels. I mean, there was the chance in 2017 on the mandate, there was the chance on the gas directive in 2019 um, and, and now again I, we, Berlin and Brussels will have to find a deal how to impose um, third energy market package regulation and I think I would like to see that and then really an, an, a common push um, with a new US administration on, on re-establishing um, working energy markets and, 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 and the push in the IEA with, we have a lot to do on, on climate and energy transformation issues, green recovery. I think it, 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 to me, Nord Stream 2, and this is my uh, last sentence has only been, it has highly politically been overloaded and, and to, to, to put on, on the priority list on the first place, and it doesn't deserve this place. There are much bigger issues to deal with. Well, this hour has passed incredibly quickly, and I feel that although we've touched on, you've touched on a lot of topics, there are still a lot of issues to talk about, but it underscores for me um, how much there is on the common agenda for the United States and Europe, and specifically for Germany and the United States to be addressing. Um, I think, Dan Fried, you said it early on when talking about Nord Stream 2, it's a mess. Kirsten Westphal, you talked about the shades of gray and that there's very little that's black and white. Uh, I think you're both absolutely right, and I want to thank you for, for helping parse this issue um, and all of the related issues. Uh, that come together when talking about Nord Stream 2 for all of us. So I, I truly thank both of you for this discussion. It's been incredibly thoughtful and incredibly thought-provoking. I want to thank our viewers for weighing in with their many thoughtful questions as well. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you, hopefully in person before too long. Um, but particularly as, as this topic continues to unfold, uh, Ambassador Kirsten, I hope we can meet up again um, and, and continue the discussion. But until then, stay well, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for organizing this. This was great. Yeah, my pleasure and honor. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. You too.